Did you know Variety, the children's charity, is the entertainment charity started by a group of show business people who found an abandoned baby in a theatre way back in 1928. These kind-hearted performers raised so much money to help the lost child that they began helping other children. And Variety, the children's charity, was born. Read the full story and support the entertainer's charity that supports kids in need today. Visit variety.org.au. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Maury Morgan. Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? That is the shittiest knuckle I have ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having no. listened to it. That's a bucket list. <laughs> you have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Louis Pasteur, the famous French scientist, once said, Chance favours the prepared mind, when describing how he was able to see opportunities that others had not. The same is true for comedians, as you'll hear from this enlightening interview with Marty Wilson. Serendipitously thrust into comedy via a comedy leaflet and encouraged to launch a UK comedy career through a chance encounter on a flight with musician Jimmy Barnes, Marty's mind was prepared for these chances and so he took them. In this School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast interview, we discuss Marty's life as a stand-up, his transition into keynote speaking, and how he combines comedy with topics on resilience, workplace motivation, and general mental health and well-being. If you're just starting out in comedy or a veteran in the field, then you'll enjoy this interview with Marty Wilson. Good afternoon, Marty. G'day, Murray. How are you, mate? Oh, very good. You're in Sydney, I believe. In Bondi in Sydney, yes. Bondi, very nice. How is the weather there in Bondi? Uh, it's like it's been all winter. Cold but sunny. Cold but sunny. Then, then, yeah, Sydney's always yeah, a nice amazing, city amazing. to fly into. And then then we, uh, if, if you're doing what I'm doing, living in Melbourne, you then get on a domestic flight and uh, pop down to Melbourne. And the cloud cover is a stark difference between Sydney and Melbourne. <laughs> Here's a Melbourneian giving a, a Sydney cider <laughs> some some credit. Yeah, very, very true. Often. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Marty, for your time. We are the School of Hard Knock Knocks. We talk about stand-up comedy. We talk about uh, the ups and downs of comedy, how people got started in the business, the challenges and advice. And um, oh, when I came across your profile and the the kind of work that you've done uh, here in Australia and also in the UK, I thought, oh, I've got to get you on because you know um, you know the ups and downs, you know how to accidentally fall into something, and um, you know you know life <laughs> after stand-up yeah. comedy. I mean, well, you still do it, but in a different way. So for those listening to this podcast, yeah, yeah this might be a new direction that they might consider. If they're a veteran comedian, they might consider a direction similar to your own. But let's go all the way back. Let's go way, way back. So you're, sure, sure. you're, you're known as a stand-up comedian also an MC. We'll come to MC in a moment, but let's go back to that time when I believe you were in, was it advertising? You're in pharmacy? Yeah. I, I was uh, um, I was a registered farm. I mean, I still am technically a registered yep. pharmacist, but I, uh, I was doing a bit of freelance work in advertising and the agency I worked at was all, you know, Ponytails and Apple Macs back in the Very late good. 90s. And uh, one of those, like... Um, obscenely pumped up goal sessions that uh, like, you know, would have made Tony Robbins a stick his head in and go, Oh geez, guys, just uh, yeah, lighten up. Yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> you know, just settle down a bit guys. Um, and going around the table, talking about where we wanted to go. And, and I just happened to mention that I wouldn't mind giving stand up yeah, right. a go. And this typographer at the other end of the room piped up and said, Oh, I got this flyer at central station given to me mm. this morning. And it was this flyer called the thing called the Virgin sacrifice, which was, a lovely lady by the name of Lynn Pierce, who'd done a lot of theatre sports and a lot of acting training yep. through NIDA, was running the first of this series where she wanted seven or eight people to come and workshop some material together in front of each other for four or five weeks. And then we took over the Harold Park Hotel's uh, famous open mic night mm -hmm. on a Monday night. So a few of us all got together and um, with a bit of, you know, Lynn's help, just uh I guess I, you know, performed a bit of material in front of a supportive audience for four or five weeks first, and then we all did the open mic night. It was one of those things where my thing went really well. I mean, I, I'd always been, like, 
the Clark mm-hmm. idiot and the one getting up and doing doing skits in front of the school, taking the mickey out of the headmaster and that sort of thing, and doing people's 21st speeches and all that sort of stuff. So I'd always loved doing it. And the first gig went really well. The Harold Park asked me back the next week, and then the third week they yeah. paid me. And it was just like, hang on one second. <laughs> hang yeah. on a minute. Uh, so that, and and that was the end of it. I uh, just threw myself into it and absolutely loved it. Well, that's that's amazing. So it was a serendipitous moment, an accidental sort of comment that came out. If that guy had missed the pamphlet on his way to the to the session, the, yeah. oh, this podcast wouldn't be happening. Yeah. I might have still been twenty years. That's twenty years later. I, I might have still been saying to myself, "Oh, I'd love to give stand up a go one day." Yeah, amazing. Yeah. But, uh, a, a lovely serendipitous moment. Amazing. And I understand that that particular class, uh, or at least perhaps the next class, had some uh, other famous people in it. Um, Undo? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Undo was in the second graduating class of uh, the Virgin Sacrifice. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of CL, uh, CL Stowe, who's still out doing stand-up these days. Sarah Levitt, um, who still does it these days. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of uh, other people... um, who did that? Went through that class and is still still doing stand up. There, um, a guy called the Dixter who sadly passed away uh, a couple of years ago now um, from cancer. Mm. But uh, yeah, probably Arn and myself are the ones who've gone on to the biggest things. And obviously, Arn has gone on to a hell of a lot bigger than me when it comes to doing stand up. But funnily enough, it was actually Arn who convinced me. Sort of, we can complete the circle on this later. But when I got back from the, my uh, eight year stint in the UK doing stand up over there. It was Arne who took me aside and said, look, Marty, stop calling it stand-up comedy. Uh-huh. Call it corporate keynote speaking. It pays a hell of a lot better. <laughs> and and that's, that's, what got me in, that's what got me into uh, what I do now. Yeah, right, right. Well, yeah, we definitely will come to that. So let's keep back in. This is the 90s, or is it my understanding? So your first gig, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, got called ba- you got paid on your third gig? My third gig, yeah, I've still got that little forty dollars, forty dollars, two twenty dollars notes in a little frame in in, uh, in the corner oh. of my office. <laughs> oh, very nice. Are they, it was the red one with the red notes, the uh, paper version. Yeah, 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 the old uh, red red paper notes. Yeah, yeah. The lobbies, the lobsters. Oh, they're at least <laughs> they're worth about twenty dollars fifty now, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, you just alluded to. In fact, you just were quite explicit in talking about the UK. You then decided that you were going to take your comedy overseas. Now. Was the... Yeah, it, it was. It was on the back of um, I won this thing called Green Faces, um, mm. which was a comedy competition running Canberra, and it was. Um, I when I talk about it these days in my promotional stuff, I call it Australian Comic of the Year because no one knows what the hell Green Faces it was, but it was the the only right, right. national Australian competition that was open to anyone. Like Raw was around then. But you had to have, I think, done a maximum of five paid gigs to get into Raw. Mm-hmm. But this this mm-hmm. one was open to anyone at all in the comedy right. thing, and I I won that. And, and on the back of that, that gave me a lot of confidence, I guess. And I ended up um, travelling to the UK in '99 just on a bit of a fun tour, and and that was back in the days oh, when no, the Aussie no. dollar bought 40, 32 pence, not fifty eight or so, like it does now. So I so I did a fair. I just yep. lined up a few gigs yeah, yeah. Uh, through a great comedian called Trevor Crook. I don't know if you know Trevor. He um, his his agent over there got me a few gigs, yep. and when his agent saw me, it was one of those lovely things when he said, oh, look, you know, I can have your diary for when are you going to come over here? And I, I thought about it, and when I came back to Australia after this sort of bit mm-hmm. of just a tourist holiday travelling, following the Rugby World Cup around and that sort mm-hmm. of thing in 99, I ended up supporting a guy called Stevie Starr. Like, I don't know light if you bulbs. remember him. He, he was on, like, the footy shows and that sort of stuff where he would – yeah, yeah, yeah. You would like swallow billiard balls and light bulbs and then bring them bring them back up again. So my career was really taking off when yeah, I was yeah, supporting well. Stevie Star around around country around country New South Wales. But I right. ended up on the flight to Dubbo in New South Wales sitting next to Jimmy Barnes. And uh just when Barnes he sat down and, and he said, you know, uh G'day, Barnes. You know, said, I said, he asked me what I was doing. I said, oh, I'm a stand-up comic. And he just started telling me joke after joke after joke. And in the end, I said to him, look, Barnesy, if I don't sing any chisel for the rest of this flight, and he just went, uh, all right, mate, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we actually had a proper conversation. And he was tell- he told me the story. It was actually Jimmy Barnes that convinced me to go to London. Okay. Um, because he said that 
there was a stage when men at work were supporting Chisel on a tour around Australia, mm-hmm. and then Australia won the America's Cup. Um, 80, 83. Land yeah. Down Under went but Land Down Under went bananas. Yep. And then Chisel were supporting men at work on a tour yeah. around Australia. Yeah, right. And Barnsley was saying, you know, I've, Barnsley said, like, I, I felt really sorry for them because they didn't have enough material to be a headline act yet. Uh. And, and so he said, you know, remember how the Beatles went to Germany for two years and just played and played and played and played and played, yep, yep. and that's when they got that's when they got really great. So the plan was for me to go take this agent up on his offer to come to the UK and go there for a year and a half, two years, just jam as much stage time as I could into it, and uh, and then come back, you know, much more mature yep. comedian. And it ended up ended up that I just uh, absolutely loved it over there. You know, fell in love with an English nurse and ended up staying for eight years and didn't didn't come back for eight years later with uh, a wife and uh, my firstborn kid. I've got three kids now, but my, my firstborn child and everything. Right. So it was just an absolutely fabulous time. So I was just um. You know, full time on the UK comedy circuit, sort of headlining over there, and yep. um, did Edinburgh, did you know, did Melbourne, and all that sort of stuff, and then uh, and came back. So, if there, if there is any advice, I, I would pass on that advice to any sort of up and coming comic who's listening to your podcast, mate, and just say, find somewhere wherever I, I, I couldn't honestly tell you where that is, but find somewhere that has uh, the best comedy scene in the world, right. and just go there. Yep. Go there and just jam as much stage time as you can into as short a space of time as possible, yep. and it'll, it'll be the best thing for you. I promise. Yeah, great, great. It sounds like a reverse of Jeff Green, who is English and met an Australian woman yep. in the UK, and then moved to Australia uh, with her, and uh, and now does comedy here. And we're lucky enough to have him as a local in in Melbourne. But yeah, yeah, no, I know Jeff. He's a he's a lovely bloke and a bloody good comic. Very good. Yeah, very good. And uh, to sort of uh, in line with your pharmacy background he's a he's a i think a civil engineer so yeah you can come from any yeah, background yeah. that's right that's right yeah yeah, yeah. so that, that's fantastic so you came back and you, you eight years you came back with a family and children and uh, obviously some great mm. great content and you then decided as ung do perhaps recommended or ung do explicitly said you should MCing and corporate functions. So is there much of a jump from performing a 45-minute set where everyone expects to have a laugh to having some kind of, is there a moral to the story at these co- corporate events? Do you have to talk about the bottom line or no, well, the managing the, director says you've got to slip this one in? Or? The, the, the evolution of it, it, um, it was a, possibly a bit a bit slower than that. It, um, uh, when I came back, to be honest, I was... I was a bit over the whole stage time and travel and that sort of thing for a couple of years. I came back yep. and I, I stumbled on my old comedy diary not too long ago and I did uh, four and a half gigs a week for eight years when I was over there. Wow. And so yep. that, like, that's how much work there was in the UK at the time. I'm not sure it's quite as good anymore. but um, yep. And so I was quite happy. I, I um, launched a, uh, a, a book series called What I Wish I Knew with a mate of mine. He ended up leaving. But it's, I've got, so I've got 12 books in this series where I asked people if you could go back and give your younger self one bit of advice about whatever the, you know, I've got one on depression, one on cancer, one on mm-hmm. um, love, one on motherhood, all these sort of things. Yeah. Um, and so I was very content to do that for a couple of years, but then people kept asking me to speak about my books and what, <clears throat> pardon me, and what, uh, what I'd learned from interviewing yep. all these people, because I interviewed over a thousand people from all around the world now. Yeah, well. And then that, sort of turned into um, my corporate keynote, which is yeah. sort of the, um, if you ask that many people how to do life well, you know, how to get live a life without regrets, some familiar themes come up again and again and again. But, yeah, um, yeah. but, but, I, but I have to admit, you know, if, um, if you saw me do, you know, a one-hour keynote uh, at a corporate function and you'd seen me doing stand-up before, you'd say, well, you know, to be honest, Marty, that's just um, 45 minutes of stand-up with about 10 minutes you know, uh, quasi-business-like talk just to conv- convince people to buy you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, yes, I mean, if if there was anyone... Um, th- I guess the difference in it is when you're a stand-up, and I, I think that's why I struggled to make this speaking thing work for a while. You know, when you're a stand-up, if you just kill it every time you go on stage, if you just do really well yep. every time you go on stage, word will spread and you will get more work. Yep. Um, whereas doing the corporate stuff, the MC stuff and everything, you have to work out 
um, how to sell yourself. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, which you know, some people don't want to do that, but I, I, I almost uh, became a teacher when I when I left school. Yep. So I, I, I actually quite like the balance. It's sort of like doing a festival show where um, you know you can go a bit dark for four or five minutes and there can be no laughs at all. Yep. Like in my keynote about resilience, I end up talking about how my wife and I um, got through her battle with postnatal depression yep. Um, yep. using a fair bit of humour and that sort of thing. Yep. Um um, and but then you know as long as you bring them back and end on a high and end on some laughs, then they're happy to go there with you, That's like true. in a festival room or something like that. Yeah, right. Bring them up just like the uh, the the plot curve of a movie. Sort of bring them up, bring yes. them down, and then bring them up to yeah. the climax and finish. Yeah. The old uh, Shakespearean: make them laugh, make them cry. <laughs> yeah, and and with them seeing, there's an extra challenge in that 99 percent of the people in the room didn't buy a ticket necessarily to see you. Whereas if you're in a, a comedy gala or a um, got your own show at the international comedy festival somewhere in the world, people know what they're getting into. Yes. So your audience, as as a presenter, how do you then modify how you perform yep. and the content and the content that you say in relation to the audience that might not even have a clue who you are? Yeah, no, it's a good point. And um, for, you know, comics who are, who are listening to this, it's very similar to, um, you know, as you say, when when people walk through a door and pay their own money to walk through that door, um, expecting to see yep. a, certain, like, a certain thing on the other side of that, the the contract is very pure, is the way I describe it. In that, um, yep, yep. you know, people are paying their money to laugh, and whoever makes them laugh the most tonight, well, they were the best comedian tonight. I don't care what style of comedy they did. Yep. Um, if they made the audience laugh the most tonight, they were the best comic on the night. Yep. Whereas doing what I do now, there is a bit more of the, um, you know, they expect you to give them some thoughts they can take away, or you know, some tips and strategies they could use in their life, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. But as long as the, the way I describe it is, I I don't use a teaspoon of sugar. I use two or three tablespoons of sugar to help the medicine go down. So right, I guess right. I'm 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 known as an incredibly funny speaker these days, rather than a reasonably preachy stand up like I used to be. <laughs> ah, right. That's good. That's good. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of MC events are uh, based around something else that might be a dinner, that might be an award ceremony, and yeah, you you can't really complicate the night with too much to learn, can you? You've just got to narrow it down, make it funny so people remember it. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, if you if you are a comic listening to this, throw your hat in the ring with respect to corporate MC work because if you can MC uh, like a comedy club where half the crowd is on the, on the staff Christmas party where the boss, it's exactly the same as where the boss has paid for all their tickets. He loves comedy, half his staff don't give a don't yep. give a rat's ass about it. They're just um, they just there no. want to get on the lash on their on the boss's money. Um, it's it's uh, it's just like that. <laughs> so it's, um, if you can handle that, you can handle corporate um, MC work on your ear. Yep. Please give it a go. Please give it a go. <laughs> Very good. And for anyone listening who's not from Australia, get on the lash means uh, blind or <laughs> drinking a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, <laughs> yes. Drink way too much. Drinking way too much. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, so what advice would you then give to – perhaps let's go back to the newbies. Um, the veteran comedians, probably not, not a problem. They can adapt accordingly based on your advice just now. But what about writing material for an audience when you have to be a bit more careful? Um, you know, someone like Greg Fleet, who is a shocking comedian. I mean, he shocks people as part <laughs> yeah, of yeah. his – He's set, and he and he wants to shock people, but he's also complained that he doesn't get too many corporate events. In fact, he doesn't really want them because he, he has a bit yeah. of a hit and miss uh, yeah, result. Sure. So, what about writing material? Where, how do you write material that's relevant to the corporate world or relevant? It's a bit safer, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess could I um, could I take one step backwards before I talk about that? Mm. And that um, the the one thing I would do um, if if you're a newbie listening to this, um, it was almost like I was foreshadowing my what I wish I knew series when I was doing stand up. I swallowed my pride and contacted the ten or twelve best stand ups that I could find in Australia, yep. and just bought them a beer, a coffee, a, a slice of baklava, whatever they wanted, mm -hmm. and just said, you know. 
Down, you are 10 years ahead of me in this game. Download any, any tips you could give me. If you could go back to your to my position now, yep. what would you do differently? And so, you know, for example, um, so I rang Kitty Flanagan, James O'Loughlin, Akmel Sali, Pete Burner. Oh, great um, names. Uh, and um, and ju- and just went to see them and like for example, um, Pete Burner gave me this fantastic technique. Um, God love him that I used again, and again, and again on the circuit where he he mentioned that um, he said I this is Pete. So I I used to have a lot of material, a, a fair bit of material about drugs. Mm-hmm. So what I what I used to do, I would just do two or three jokes that I know work, and then just start talking. And if nothing funny had come out after a minute and a half. Mm-hmm. Then I'd go back and, and go back and do another couple of jokes that I know work to get the audience back on side, yep. and then start talking again. Because I guess I back myself in that if I talk, some funny stuff will come out. Oh, that's right. And he said, and he said, uh, doing that, so writing new material on stage just by talking wow. on stage. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, I started out with four or five minutes worth on drugs that I'd. Um, you know, written in the back of the in the back of the room or written at home, yeah. and then by a year later, I had a whole hour on drugs just by continually writing on stage and recording my performances and going back and listening to it. Yeah. So, so that tip for me was just worth its weight in gold. And then I remember I was doing a little tour around Ireland with um with Adam Hills, and, and Adam mm-hmm. Hills said to me, "Never lose your temper at a crowd." because it shows you're out of control and yeah. you have to be the alpha. You have to be the alpha in the yeah. room. Yeah. Um, and, and so like every single comic that I did one of these interviews with, they all gave me like two or three things that were just absolute gold. Like a guy called Mike Wilmot, um, a fantastic Canadian comic that I work with over in the UK. Mm-hmm. He said um, someone gave him this bit of advice when he was just starting out. And he said, because your brain works far faster than your hand does, mm-hmm. if you want to come up with new material, write your set out like word for word on a bit of paper longhand. Mm-hmm. Because as you're, as you're writing, your brain will be like, you know, just firing, riffing off on other sorts of things, going yep. faster, far faster than your hand does, yep, yep. and new ideas will come. And if you've got, um, you know, if you've got a really tight two or three minutes on a subject you want to have more on, I promise you, use that technique and more jokes will come. So, yeah, right. um, so there's, so there's sort of two parts to what I'm saying. Like those techniques are fantastic, but more importantly, if you're just a starting comic, um, don't continually, you know, try and prove yourself against um, the best guys in the business. Like, drop your defenses. You know, be a bit humble mm-hmm. and and just ask them. You know, like ask them. Like, you know, what did, what did, what worked for you when you were at my level? You know, like what works for you to get you to the next level? You know, what mistakes could I make? You know, a, a ridiculously stupid thing that actually saved me so much money was a guy called Richard Carter, um, who was a really famous comic at the Comedy Store here in Sydney. Yeah. Um, he doesn't do any stand up anymore, but uh, he said to me, it's a really weird thing, but he said, when you're checking out of a hotel room, put your bag outside the door, then go back in and check the hotel room again. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a, re- it's a really dumb thing, but I promise you, you'll find your iPod, you'll, you know, you'll find your watch. Like uh, over the years, it saved me so much money. Just that one little thing that I do yeah. every time I check out of a hotel room. So just every person on the circuit who's ahead of you can give you mistake, can give you um, tips that will make your life so much easier, make you progress through the ranks so much faster. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that very wise words. Well, this is um, if you're listening to this, and this is the first one you've listened to. If, if Marty Wilson's the first person you've you've heard in this podcast series, then make sure you check the others in the in the list. Oh, that's good. On that note, on about topics themselves, um, you know, you're talking about the topic of uh, hotel rooms. Yep. That's just come up in the in your little anecdote right now. How do you do, do you sit down on a sofa? Do you um, walk around the block, take the dog for a, a walk or something equivalent to generate content in its own right? Um, yeah, it's one of those things. Um, sometimes I deliberately sit down and try to write uh, material about a particular topic. Um, uh, but mm-hmm. other times it's more like I had um, – when I was doing stand-up, I always had like a notebook and a pencil with me at all times just because um, yeah. life is really funny. Like people are really funny. 
and um, and I always I, I'm, I'm down in my garage now. I've got like about six or seven of these notebooks that are just rammed full of scribbles. Now I, I use you know Evernote or an app on my phone or something like yep. that. Yep. And 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 even um, you know write down when you see another comic uh, come out with a really good line. Um, write it down in your notebook or in your phone and examine the format of that joke. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because you know a lot, a lot of, a lot of you know, humour has formats where, and you can learn those, and then you can express your thoughts in using formats that have been, you know, tried and tested by the, you know, hundreds and thousands of people who have written funny stuff before you. Yeah, and and even you know, become a student of funny. Become you know, deliberately try to read as much as you can about. Um, how to construct humour, how humour works. And there's a lot more stuff out there these days than there was um, when I was just starting. It's probably why I ended up having to uh, to interview people. But just, you know, even um, uh, Paul Simon in, in one of his plays, I forget the play, he talked about just, um, we had one of his characters just so he could get the thought out there, just explosive P and B and K mm-hmm. sounds are funnier. Yeah, yes, you know, true. So, so like... Um, you know, Timbuktu is funnier than Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, a, you know, a chicken and pickle sandwich is funnier than uh, a ham sandwich yep. and stuff like that. Yep. So, you know, you look at uh, Jerry Seinfeld's, um, you know, Jerry Seinfeld's movie, The Comedian, like watch that about 30 times. <laughs> yeah. Because he, 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 talks, he talks about the craft of taking this word out and putting this word in mm. and your joke will be, you know, 15% funnier. And if you run through that process 12 times with that one joke, it'll end up being five times as funny. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so in, in, in just quickly, in, in terms of you asked me before about um, coming up with uh, if you want to get into, you know, the corporate MC work and that sort of things, safe humour, the thing I, I say to start mm-hmm. with is um, watch, ask your friends and family what are the top five funny stories that I tell socially again and again and again. And, you know, those stories that, you know, your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend rolls their eyes when you're at the dinner party. He says, oh, geez, he's telling the Star Wars story mm-hmm. again. Here we go. Here, Here we go. Again. And yeah. start with them because you know they work. Um, and uh, chances are, if you can tell them at a dinner party, they're not absolutely disgraceful mm-hmm. and, you could, and you could modify them to the point where they'd be okay at a, at a corporate event. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, you know, when you've told a story, you know, you know, it's about – stage time, like um, Barzi said to me, but if you've told these stories socially 50 times, then as soon as you start into them, like, you know, you know what information you have to get across, you know where the punchlines are, and once you start into stories that are familiar to you, you know, your brain relaxes and your shoulders sort of broaden a bit, you smile a bit, and you just exude that confidence that the audience loves to see on a stand-up space. that's right. And then that's important given that, you know, I think all comedians, when a a joke lands, it's certainly not the first time they've said it, in most cases, I guess, unless they're they're ad-libbing, which is quite rare. So they've said that same joke, you know, 20, could be 20 times, could be more. All right. So thanks for that. That's that's useful. Mm. And um, then the question I have now moves us into the corporate world again, because not only do you do emceeing and uh, with with comedy, as you described, but you also talk about the benefits of comedy in a workplace. And um, yeah, the, the was it, and even uh, promotions yeah. that people who are funnier ca- uh, are more likely to be promoted. How, can you uh, help us draw the line between those two points? Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it's one of those things uh, that you know, um, partly it, it's partly because I I wanted you know th- these days it's all about getting an audience to yourself and social media and all that sort of stuff and yeah. I I I didn't felt like I didn't feel like I could. Um, totally bullshit my way through and pretend I'm an authority on resilience and, and all this sort of stuff. I knew I wanted to bring humour into it in some way, so that my social media and um, my the messages and videos that I was putting out there were stuff that I would think about and read about socially anyway. Mm-hmm. So um, I've positioned myself as someone who teaches people to use humour to build resilience and use humour to build engagement and influence in yep. um, in the in the corporate sense. But thankfully, um, there's been 20, 30 years of research 
that's backing me up. And there's loads. Of, if, if people um, search for TED Talk, take funny seriously. Mm-hmm. That's my TED Talk about uh, the benefits to your resilience of um, deliberately choosing to look at your life in a funny way. Yep. Re- research has shown if you deliberately choose to make fun of your stressors, like the things that really annoy you about life, if you deliberately make fun of those things, it's like it flicks a switch in the back of your head that says to your brain, well, I must be bigger than that. If I can make fun of it, if I can take the piss out of it, then yeah. um, I, I must have control over that. Um, and so it calms your brain down. And it's been shown to, you know, even um, there was a study done at Stanford University that showed people some uh, photos of uh, quite um, disturbing things like car crashes and animal attacks and even uh, corpses and things like that. Right. And, and then it asked them to register their feelings and levels of anxiety and that sort of thing. And then it asked them to go back and look at those photos again and deliberately make up three or four alternate scenarios that could be happening yeah. in that picture, yeah. in particular things that were funny. So, like, write jokes, you know, write some really macabre, uh, you know, dark yeah. humour about those about those photos. And then it asked them to measure their, their anxiety. And everyone's anxiety went down when they deliberately chose to make fun of um, upsetting things. Yeah, right, right. And, and, and that's why, you know, at the moment when we're recording this, you know, um, Trump and King Jong, Jong-un are threatening to go to nuclear war and everything. And so, you know, it's a great time to deliberately make fun of, um, you know, the situation in the world at the moment because otherwise it just all gets a bit overwhelming because we're all a bit scared yeah, by Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. When the Germans have that word schadenfreude, which is uh, sort of uh, playing yeah, fun yeah. at someone else, else's expense, I should add. Uh, yeah, but but that, that is looking yeah, at the yeah. comical side of things. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that, that's true. So, yeah, no, I definitely know uh, the link between comedy and um, yeah, mental health. We uh, at the School of Hard Knock Knocks. That's regularly a, a common theme that we have, and in fact, occasionally we do get some mm. uh, referrals from government agencies that recommend us uh, re- recommend our training programs to. Uh, yeah, to people. fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, yeah, and, and definitely the, even the trainers, even the the resident teachers that do the courses, have very very uh, well. Some of them are tragic histories uh with their lives but they they've gone through it and they're very very upbeat very optimistic people um probably yeah, yeah. Uh, all thanks to comedy oh that's fantastic I mean, my, my wife is a uh, my, my wife is a accident emergency nurse oh right and you get a you get a room full of them together and some of the you know the the dark humor that the yeah, dark humor that comes out of the emergency services people when they're all in a room together and and they know they can't be reported to some you know overseeing body like some of the <laughs> stuff that comes out of them like even even I you know who was a seasoned comedian that has a reasonably dark sense of humor myself just like oh geez can you say that Ooh. yeah yeah <laughs> but they have to you know they have to that and. Is- and my um my wife's first mentor when she was going through nursing training did her doctorate thesis on the importance of using humour in emergency services right. as, an, as an appropriate means as an appropriate means to diffuse tension and uh, and bond a team together. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, that's that's true. That's true. All right, excellent. Well, um, we've gone very deep in this uh, this interview, but uh, thank you very much for, for taking <laughs> us there and um, and highlighting no that importance. If someone wants to get hold of Marty Wilson for an event, corporate event, MC, get you on TV, I know you've done quite a few TV spots. Yep. How do they get in contact with you? Uh, just for corporate and speaking stuff, it's just go to martywilson.com.au. Um, or if you would like to learn how to be funnier, like I, I, I teach people who, you know, present a lot of so people do pitching or sales presentation, that sort of thing. If you go to morefunnymoremoney.com, there's um, some free resources there to help you to learn to be funnier, um, you know, a couple of free webinars you can download and, and that sort of thing and have a look at oh, there. beautiful. I will check it out. Well, Marty, thanks very much for sharing so right, much man. and very interesting, all the stories sitting next to Barnsey and heading to the UK on his no recommendation. Way. I mean, can't come from a higher authority, that's for sure. <laughs> and then your life... Your uh, life yeah, yeah. moving from the uh, comedy into a more corporate space and, and life after comedy or life, life after stand-up, perhaps, uh, inverted commas. Mm. Very useful. So, um, yeah, look... Thank you, mate. Yeah, look forward to... I'm in Melbourne, so the next time you're down here or the next time I'm up in Sydney, I'll give you a bell. That'd be great. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.